It's day 18 of the war in Israel. On this edition of Thinking Biblically, Messianic leader Michael Gertzman joins me to help us make sense of it all. A couple of weeks ago, I had my most popular podcast yet, which tragically had to do with the subject at hand for today, the war in Israel, as I had a very, I found, difficult conversation with my friend Avner Bosky living in Beersheba in Israel. And so uh, if you haven't yet seen that, I encourage you to do so. There seems to have been a, some misunderstanding about some of the questions I asked him as I, as I tried to lobball him some concerns that I thought that some people would have. And then he really, uh, really attacked those questions rather strongly. So I was a bit taken aback, but ha- thinking over what Avner said, I basically do agree with with what he said. And if you haven't yet let me know what you think about that or haven't yet seen it, and I encourage you to do so. The link will be in the description, and you can always contact me at comments at thinkingbiblically.org. Well, now it's a couple of weeks later. It's day 18 of the war in Israel, and I reached out to another Messianic leader friend of my, Messianic Jewish leader friend of mine, Michael Gertzman. We've known each other for a long, long time. He spends half the year in Israel. He's currently in Montreal, and uh, we just had a, a wonderful if wonderful is the right word, conversation about all that's going on and what it should mean to us. And then he has some very striking things to say towards the end as he begins to reflect about this uh, from a biblical perspective. So please stay with it and do be sure to, to share this with others. And so let's go to that interview now. Well, it's so special for me to have back on Thinking Biblically my friend, Michael Gertzman. Michael's been involved as a teacher and spiritual leader in various capacities in Canada and Israel since 1982. He has been instrumental in starting four Messianic congregations. In 1998, he founded Lion of Judah Ministries Canada. Michael and his wife of 54 years, Florin, spent half the year uh, half the year each in Canada and Israel, where, among other things, he's been involved in administering and funding humanitarian aid and community development projects in immigrant communities. Michael and Florin have two children and four grandchildren. Thanks for doing this with me today, Michael. You're welcome, Alan. <laughs> I I do, I know there's, you know, people know us, a lot of people don't, uh, and I just, on the personal side, I just did the official intro, but um, especially given what what we did a few weeks ago, I just wanted to share with people, you know, we go way back. We are both from Montreal, uh, but we met in Vancouver in the early 80s, and we were very involved in meetings with, uh, with uh, other Jewish believers. And eventually we started what's now called Kehilat Zion, back in the in the mid 80s in an hour living room uh, me and robin's in living room and that's still going today um and uh we then both moved to montreal and we were in touch and then we were out of touch and then we're in touch again and now uh here i am with in in ottawa and while you spend half the year in israel you're in montreal currently uh, but we just we, we had a joy just a few weeks ago. Uh, Robin and I have started to attend a small messianic fellowship here. They were celebrating their seventh anniversary it's called Shalom Restoration Fellowship. And um, Michael was there from Montreal to speak, and I got to lead worship. Uh, and it was the first time that we did that together since something like 1987. And it was precious beyond belief it was such a joy to be able to do that with you yeah it really was very 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 much so you know very much so really enjoyed it as well really. so, so now we're going to move from that precious memory to a more difficult subject as we discuss what's been going on uh with yeah. with israel um this is my first podcast since i did the one with avner bosky two weeks ago um uh-huh. which at in i don't know what to call it sadly it's been my most popular podcast by far no comparison whatsoever as yeah. people got to see me react and re- to some of the things that avner was saying i've been really um i've come a long way since two weeks ago and really challenged by avner we're going to talk about that a little bit in a moment 
Uh, but um, I was really also surprised at the amount of positive responses I was getting to what Avner had to say. And what we'll get to Avner, but I want to start with you, Michael. Uh, when did, you, where were you, what were you doing when you first heard about what was happening on October the 7th? On October the 7th, I was up uh, in a city called, in a town called Manawaki, which is about four hours north of Montreal doing a conference up there. I was one of the conference speakers. And at 7.30 in the morning, I woke up and I looked in the news. I always look at the Israeli news and I saw what had transpired. And I remember uh, it was good that I didn't have to speak till the afternoon because my heart was so heavy when I read about, you know, the attack and the slaughter and the capture and the kidnapping of these people. I was just, frankly, I was just overwhelmed. I do not know how I made it through the morning, but mercifully, I was with believing people. And I came in and I told them what happened. And I said, please, please join me in prayer. And so part of that, I was think it was two and a half days we did up there. Um, part of it had to do with, um, you know, this intercession for what was happening. And in a sense, I'm glad because it sensitized these people to, you know, not only their connection to the land and the people, but also to, to carry the burden, you know, in terms of what was happening and take that beyond the day that I left and continue to pray and join with the rest of the believers in prayer and intercession for the land and for our people and for the army and so on. So since then, um, well, how are you doing now? Well, I, I track with it daily. Um, it's interesting. Uh, I was on the phone yesterday with, uh, uh, Michael Nissim, who was Daniel Nissim's uh, uh, cousin. Uh, Michael lives across the street from me in Aharia, just to get an update on what's and happening. Daniel, and Daniel leads the fellowship that that we yeah. started all those years ago. That's that correct. Yeah. And Michael usually takes care of my apartment when I'm gone and uh, uses my library, or I should say your library. <laughs> <laughs> We don't need to get into he that. I've tried to relinquish <laughs> those way, books. By the way, he likes it. He likes it. He said, oh, you've got some good books in there, Michael. <laughs> anyway, okay, forget it, Alan, forget it. <laughs> There's more important things right now. <laughs> exactly. So I was talking to him about, you know, what's going on, because basically within four kilometers of where this, the city limits of Naharia are, uh, everything's been evacuated because we're nine kilometers from the border. And basically, uh, our city has become an army base. And the army and the police are, you know, on patrol. They're on the beach because they expect perhaps Hamas will try to come in by water, which they've done in the past. Not Hamas, I should say. Hezbollah will come in by water, which they've done in the past. So the city is, I wouldn't say it's under siege, but I would say that it's become an armed camp. The place where our congregation normally meets has become some kind of military HQ as well. So, you know, but it's interesting what he said to me. He, you know, um, I said, well, what's life like there? And he said, well, he said, you know, in some ways it's like normal. He said, I went into Aroma, you know, Aroma, it's the, you know, one of those espresso bar cafes. And he said, I went into Aroma and the place was packed and I couldn't, you know, uh, I couldn't get a seat. <laughs> and he said, look, he said, when you have a rocket, he said, I said, well, what about your congregation? Do you meet as a congregation? And he said to me, well, he said, if we have a rocket on Thursday, well, we won't meet on Saturday. He said, but if we don't have a rocket for a week, we're fine. <laughs> we'll meet. And he said, people are out on the streets. And, you know, the Israelis have gone through this. This is a 75-year-old phenomena here. So, you know, they're used to it. You know, so, one of so, the... But, let me stop you there for a second. So you're... You chuckled, and I, all the years I've known you, you're a bit of a chuckler, and oh, uh, we're not going to do psychology right now, uh, yeah. but uh, was was Michael chuckling when he t said, there's a rocket on Thursday, we won't meet on, on Shabbat? 
Michael is he, Michael is not a big chuckler, but he, you know, you could tell it was his wry sense of humor coming out. He's he's kind of dry in his sense of humor. He's a very serious guy most of the time. But so, no, I don't. Is it is there any way um, to help our listeners, viewers get a a, a sense of the Israeli spirit? Because it's, you know, I, I got to lead one tour. I hope I'll be able to do others. And one of the things I, I want to get people to connect with is that sense of normalcy that Israelis live with in the face of existential threat. Now, yeah. the concern is way higher right now. Yes. But why don't, can you, are you able to express what that's like? And you, I know you just did. Could you do a little bit more of well, what it's like to live uh, in, the, in the neighborhood and even even this the neighborhood is is right there like the 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 borders of people who want to kill uh, israelis is is right there and us in north america have no clue what that's like yes i think i'll, I'll let me let me tell you a little story of something that happened before i left um there was there were there was rocket fire and it came pretty close to the city and I remember that when we heard the bang, we knew it was close. We thought it hit the outskirts of the city, but it didn't. And everybody was out on the balconies and looking and on the street. And then because there were no sirens, we, people went back and they went back to their lives and life went back to normal, even though there had been that. Israelis have come to this point where they're not cowering in fear. You know, they understand there's a, how shall I say, there's a modus operandi during war, all right? It has to do with everything from the grocery stores and how many people can go in there and no hoarding and the growth, you know, no people are allowed to hoard and so on and so forth. But there's this tremendous spirit of unity. I mean, one of the things this war has done is taken a country that was incredibly fragmented politically along religious lines, you, you name it. We were having demonstrations of hundreds of thousands of people blocking major highways prior to all these things happening, things we'd never seen in the history of the land over, you know, over the, uh, how shall I say, the, uh, the conflict between the politicians and the Supreme Court. And I'm not going to get into that because it's a complex subject. But then all of a sudden, a land that was divided in a manner that had never been seen. I remember I was on a prayer call several weeks ago, and I said on that prayer call before the war, I said, if things don't change, because we were praying that there would be a spirit of compromise, something, something would happen. I said, if things don't change, the only thing that's going to bring us together is war because that's the way it's been in the past. I think I so was on that call or one like it when you, yeah. when you were mentioning that. Yeah, so that's what I said at the time. And that is unfortunately with that which unifies the land. So I was, again, speaking to my friend and uh, speaking to Michael, uh, and he was describing what it was like. You, you know, uh, some of the restaurants are opening and the people are buying shawarmas for the soldiers. They're buying clothes for them. They're loving on them. It's amazing. It's a totally different society than the one that I've seen from a distance because I've been in Canada now since May, the end of May. And uh, even the society that I saw when I was there, you know, in my prior stay. Uh, things have changed exponentially. The, uh, people have pulled together. They truly have. They see we have a common enemy, and it's not the Supreme Court. It's not the religious leaders who hold political office. It's not one another. We have an enemy who's, you know, virtually committed to annihilating us because they believe we have no right to be here. Yeah. So I no, do. I'd say. Yeah. Yeah. No, I want. I want to get to that. Um, I one of. The Things that have really moved me, and it's on the subject of the, just the whole attitude and spirit of, of Israelis. We have a, we're friends with a family in Jerusalem. They're not Jewish, um, yeah. but their children were born there. And unlike North America, as you know, uh, just because you're born in Israel doesn't automatically make you an Israeli citizen. But their eldest son wanted to be an Israeli, and he wanted to enlist in the IDF, and so he did that. And yeah. it was the first day, I was, it was October the 7th, and I got a picture 
of this friend's son um, whom I've met. And there he is in his uniform, getting into a taxi, going off to, to, to the base. And yeah. we've, we've kept in touch uh, since, since then, I think it was yesterday, through WhatsApp, how are you doing? And it's, we're fine. I don't know what his tone was, but we're, we're fine. And then he gives yeah. me a little update about where his son is in the country. And, and, and he's he, like, in, like thinking in, in terms of North American wars and being in Canada, the United States, and talking about the war in Europe. Oh, oh, our son is, has been called up to the front and it's thousands and thousands of miles away. But there it's, it's just about down the street yeah their their son is at the front and but we're fine and i yeah i don't think that's stiff upper lip no it's not stiff upper lip it's just that we've lived in this mode for so many years you know when i first moved to israel one of the things that used to absolutely shock me i would go into the supermarket and of course because there were only two of us our basket would be filled say this much the Israelis would fill their baskets to the top and overflowing. And I thought to myself, man, that's expensive. People here, a lot of them don't earn a lot of money. Why do they need all this food? And then I came to realize as I lived there that we've lived in this state for so long that we never know when it's going to happen. So in other words, always, people, always ready, always ready. So in other words, that kind of that, that kind of attitude has, you know, has prevailed. But I think that as, to be honest with you, that as the land has prospered, you know, as we've seen this incredible uptick economically, and as we, you know, saw our military increase not only in strength, but in sophistication, in the weaponry and so on and so forth, I believe that we began to become slack in terms of vigilance. Now, someone would say to me, oh, this isn't the case. but I, you know, given what happened on October 7th, I would say that, yes, we definitely let our guard down and began to think we were fine. This wasn't going to happen. They were just rattling their sabers. Nothing will happen to us. So what I'm saying to you is that, you know, I'm think of, you know, I think of Deuteronomy 32, to be honest with you, where the Lord speaks about how he found us in the wilderness and, the, and you know, uh, and he hovers over us like an eagle that, you know, takes care of her chicks and brings us into this land and we become prosperous and so on and so forth. And we become slack. We became slack in our worship and we probably became slack in terms of, you know, what was around us and the, you know, the attitude of the nations around us. And this is exactly what I see as I looked at contemporary Israeli society. But it takes a war to bring us back to where we really are, who our neighbors really are, what their motivations really are. And it brings us back to the old days, so to speak. And, you know, and, and that follows. Yeah, it's one of the, the things that, you know, I heard people reacting uh, with, um, what were they doing having a party so close to Gaza? What are they doing? What are the, and, and, and the immediate thing is putting all the blame on Israeli intelligence and government yeah. of, of, of not doing their job, but not realizing how, um, I, I, I don't, if, if it, is it complacent or confident, or is it a, an interesting mixture to, to think that, as you were describing earlier with the hearing the rocket blast some time ago uh, near your city, it's kind of like normal life. So a rocket comes, Iron Dome shuts, you know, blasts out of the sky or lands in a field. Every now and then somebody gets hurt, but people get hurt every day. They get hurt more on the highway than they do from rocket blasts. And we're, we're Israel, we're okay. Um, and and I think for a lot of us, when we heard what happened, we th we're thinking of all the other wars as if yes. that's the consciousness of the people when when it's actually it's not it's it's going no. to parties uh it's it's going to aroma coffee which i would love to do and um it's living normal life and then and then this happens and it's a, a yet again another wake-up call yeah i think one of the things that has happened through the years is that well since mr netanyahu has been the prime minister you know, when we get a few rockets from Gaza or, uh, you know, many, 
we went into this mode of what people have called mowing the lawn. In other words, we would respond proportionately until things calmed down and went back to sleep, so to speak. Of course, they never did go back to sleep. The fact of the matter was they were digging up water lines and using the metal pipes for rockets and so on and so forth. But this stuff was happening in a sense, I wouldn't say invisibly, probably our intelligence uh, knew this. But what I do feel about it was for so long we had adopted this attitude that, you know, somehow this will all stop, it'll all go away, and they'll go back to seemingly back to sleep for a while. This one took us by surprise because we never expected anything of this magnitude to happen with the barbarity and brutality with which it happened. So, as I say, this what I'll call years of this particular philosophy militarily I think has cost us. So the people stayed in the Gaza envelope. They stayed on their kibbutzim. They, they lived their lives there, did the things that they do in the kibbutzim. These people went to a rave down somewhere in the area, never thinking, you know, it's going to be like it was a few rockets or many rockets. We'll take care of it. It'll all stop. They'll, you know, we'll go down. We'll have a good time in the Negev and so on and so forth. But this time, this time, was a bad one. Okay, this time was a bad one, and that was pretty uh, was made clear by my ch my quote unquote chat with Avner a couple of weeks ago. Now I know you've watched it. What what yeah. were your thoughts on on his perspective? Well, I'm going to tell you something, Alan. You sent me two articles. You know, there was I I watched your um, interchange with Avner on your podcast. And I also read the thing that your son Josh wrote. And the, I came out of it uh, with a certain very uh, clear-cut view that when you look at diaspora jury and the situation of diaspora jury, a lot of the attitudes reflected by are Josh... You saying, are you saying diaspora jury? The Jewish people living outside the land? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, right. Sorry, that's good. When I look at the attitude of diaspora jury... And the, the way they respond to things, uh, we're a minority in a country where we are a minority. And we need to curry favor, of course. We need to have friends. And I agree with that because we don't really have protection. I remember one day I was sitting with a pastor friend at a pizza place in Montreal on DeCary Boulevard, one you probably know. Um, I forget the name of it now. It'll come back to me. And we were talking about, you know, these things. This goes back quite a few years because he passed on several years ago. And we had a guy sitting next to us and who was a Jewish guy. And he was listening to our conversation and our interchange. And basically he said, I'm very interested in what you're saying. And so we said, well, one day this is going to happen here. Believe me, this is going to happen here. Oh, no, he says, we have the police to protect us. Well, the fact of the matter is, that we have an unfortunate history with the authorities who do the best they can. But the fact of the matter is we are vulnerable and we need to seek means of, you know, protecting ourselves even here. As a matter of fact, I see this uptick in street demonstrations of massive size as if it produces no effect politically, it's going to produce an effect socially here in terms of the attitudes toward Jewish people. So diaspora Jew Jewry has one particular focus, okay? We're safe here, pretty much. But when you look on the Israeli side of things, Alan, you see something very different. That these people are at our borders. In fact, they surround us. If it wasn't for the cold peace we have with Egypt and Jordan, we'd have them on those two sides as well. We'd have them, we'd be surrounded north, south, west, and east. But the fact of the matter is it's very, very, very real. And we know very well that the people in Gaza, the Hamas, uh, you know, you hear this chant from the river to the sea, Palestine shall be free, that this is in fact what they believe. They, and this is what they are working toward. And there'll never be peace with them because from their point of view, we are, we have no legitimate claim to the land. We have no legitimate right to be there, even though it was the United Nations that came up with a partition plan that gave us a place in the land. The very organization that now has tried with all its might and main to delegitimize us. But nevertheless, 
what we see is we're living with people who basically want to annihilate us and drive us out. So therefore, we have no choice in the matter but to adopt a very different attitude. And as I said, this mowing the grass philosophy that Mr. Netanyahu and previous governments have adopted have led us to the place where these people became sufficiently emboldened to do what they did. Now, in the name of self-defense, and that's precisely what it is, we have to respond in an extremely, extremely, extremely hard manner. And so that's where we are in this thing. We don't have choices. It's not like diaspora jury who will flee to the mountains, so to speak, or find a place to hide, you know, or go to our friends or whatever. Here, we are immediately threatened as a people and we need to defend ourselves. Like I remember this conversation you had with Avner about turning the other cheek, all right? And it, it becomes, you know, I think when we look at this issue of turning the other cheek, what we're looking at is the issue of retaliation versus self-defense. And, you know, the Bible is full of examples of where we've had to defend ourselves. We had to defend ourselves against Amalek when he, when he attacked us in Exodus 17 when we were in the, in the desert and many other places. So, therefore, self-defense is warranted. The problem with Hamas is that, uh, you know, where they place their military emplacements, their, their rockets and all their military hardware, both in residential neighborhoods, because basically there's very little open space in Gaza and underneath the ground. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be a tremendously difficult endeavor. And except the Lord be with us to help us in this matter, it is going to be very, very messy and it's going to be long term. So we're going to see what happens, but we have no choice. Okay. Yeah, let me, so let me jump in. Um, I talked to Avner on, uh, on Friday, um, and, yeah. uh, th we're, we're recording this, you and me, it's, uh, yeah. it's Tuesday, the 24th of, uh, October. I hope to get it posted today as well. Yeah. Uh, but, um, he was telling me people were contacting him wondering where I stood and I get, the, I, I, I think, I don't know if people understood why I was asking some of the questions I was asking. Yeah. I think some people might have thought some of my reactions were, were fake. I, I don't know. I can't read people's minds. Uh, but some of those questions, like the one turn the other cheek, that's a lob, we'll call a lob, lob ball question yeah. that I was yeah. hoping that Avner was going to give a, a good answer to because I believe there are people out there that think exactly that. I didn't know that when I lobbed the ball to Avner, he was going to smash that thing to oblivion. <laughs> and then that's, that's why I reacted the way I did. I just say, I, like, I get it, but I've never heard anybody actually say, yes, we're supposed to love our enemies, but sometimes we have to kill them too. Because yeah, we, right. we, we believers, at least outside of Israel, maybe. And I was just reading today in the Times of Israel, which I've, I've appreciated to some extent, um yeah. what the, some of their reporting but you know these there was this second pair of hostages that were released yeah. and and this uh 80 something year old woman uh, was they had some sort of press conference and they're giving some backstory and her and her husband living almost right at the gaza fence are yeah. part and parcel of the peace movement in israel so that's a, so it's not only Christians, it's not only Westerners that want to think that we need to play nice and we need to hold hands and sing Kumbaya as quickly as possible. There's even Israelis, Israelis in Israel that, that think that we can make nice with the Palestinians. Yeah. And what I was getting from Avner, and I was really, some of that was legitimate questioning. Like I'm looking for new, is there nuance here? With Avner, there was no nuance. This was like the allies having to attack Germany and there was going to be collateral damage. We're sorry about it, but it, yeah. it's a necessary, it's an, he, well, he was hardly calling it a necessary evil. It's just plain necessary. Can, can you yeah. respond to that? Yes. Um, I think, you know, we've been very principled, you might say, uh, in our warfare in the sense that we want to limit as much as it's humanly possible to do or militarily possible to do collateral damage, meaning the death of civilians, the death and injury of civilians. 
but it needs to be balanced with the fact that these people have, you know, hid themselves in a civilian population. And consequently, when we look to target their military, you know, uh, facilities, uh, we have no choice but to hit civilian areas. That causes a tremendous amount of, of difficulty for, for us. Now, what we've done in the past is what's called knocking, you know, where we warn civilians in advance. And that's precisely what's happened and with, now. And with leaflets and with text messages for people to that's flee. Right. And basically about 700,000 or more of them have gone, and I guess they've gone south. Egypt refuses to open its border because they've done it before and paid the price for it. So they don't want the Palestinians. Jordan doesn't want them either. They don't want the trouble that they bring. They're not highly regarded uh, in the Middle East, okay? So consequently, these people are fleeing south, but 200,000... But if they're, not, if they're not highly regarded, uh, why do they... Why are they so supported in reason, another way? Okay, the reason why has to do with Islamic solidarity, you might say, and the teachings of the Quran. I mean, on one hand, they're a pain, and on the other hand, you know, they feel obliged, according to their religion, to oppose us and to support them. So therefore, you know, there's, how shall I say, you know, there's a sort of dichotomy in their thinking. And the ones who support, support for religious reasons, not because they're worthy people, because they're really not esteemed in the rest of the Arab world at all. They're, they're thought to be a bunch of thugs by some of the Arab nations. So therefore, what I'm saying to you is it's a religious obligation. That's why they support more than anything else. And, and I, I think it's so hard for the Western mind to comprehend how you could, yeah. how, on one hand, and we know the, how divided the, the, the Arab world, the Islamic world is, and they're yeah. fighting their own wars. Yes. Uh, but when it comes to Israel, they, there's this other, so they, there seems to be, Hamas is viewed as in, in de deplorable in one sense in the Arab world. On the other sense, they support the fact that they are, want to annihilate Israel. Yeah. Well, I don't think that they support the fact that they want to annihilate in Israel. For example, take a lot of people are saying that Hamas started this because they wanted to scuttle this deal between Saudi Arabia and Israel. The United Arab Emirates have come into a commercial relationship with the Israelis. Israelis have traveled uh, to the UAE and to Dubai and other places. And the Saudis, you know, see the commercial opportunity with the Israelis especially for advanced weaponry and many other things. They wanted to start a commercial relationship. And their king, he's a young guy, he's in his late 30s, he wants that relationship. But what's happening is, uh, you know, Mecca is the center of Islam. And again, there's this, you know, there's this conflict between, you know, religious obligation and just plain, ordinary, pragmatic, you know, life. And so consequently, there's, for example, they say things like, well, you know, this can happen. We can have this trade relationship and so on if you give the Palestinians their state, so to speak, this two-state solution thing. And so consequently, what I see is that depending on the pressure that they feel from other segments of the Arab world, uh, from the religious, you know, uh, the religious minorities, majorities, they respond and say things and support. But the one who actually gives money is Qatar. They're entirely on their side. So, and also, too, they speak through two sides of their mouth. On one hand, they seem to be ready to broker certain types of more peaceful activities. And on the other hand, they give them millions, billions of dollars, which end up in the pockets of the leadership of Hamas. Everybody knows it. They end up in tunnels, the cement, that goes into rebuild homes, goes into the making of tunnels, uh, military equipment and hardware uh, comes into the land, probably smuggled through Egypt. That's why they blew up all the tunnels. But one way or another, all the monies that are being given to Hamas basically are being put into the military. That's why, that's exactly why it's an impoverished enclave, a totally impoverished enclave. 
So it's, uh, you know, it's, a, it's what we would call in Hebrew, a, well, it's not even Hebrew, it's Russian, a balagan. That's exactly what it is. So the Arabs are divided in a sense. The Saudis are, you know, basically they export globally oil and other things. You know, these, the, the UAE has become a center of global, you know, commercial enterprise. And so they see profit in establishing, a, you know, a strong links with Israel. But on the other hand, there's the religious thing which causes them to take the side of the Palestinians or appear to. But their statements, if you read it, if you read their statements at other times, they're not exactly complimentary or flattery, flattering rather toward the Palestinians. On the contrary, they're quite sometimes quite derogatory. And they wish they weren't there, but they are. And they're religiously obligated to help them in some measure. But have, have you heard any um, strong words of condemnation from the Arab world for what Hamas did? Initially, there were over what happened on October 7th, okay? Initially, those things came. I mean, they realized that what Hamas, you know, Hamas basically was doing what ISIS did. And ISIS was a threat to, you know, all the world. And, in, you know, especially the Muslim world. So consequently, you know, they saw ISIS-like behavior on the part of uh, Hamas. And they did condemn it. But in the long run, in the long run, when they look at it, you know, they know very well that if in the face of uh, things, if they establish these ties with Israel, it's going to be a liability. It's going to cause all kinds of problems in the, wor in the Arab world in the Muslim world, I should say. And, you know, so there's this ambivalence, this going back and forth. So it's hard to discern Arab attitudes. What they say to one another in private may be very, very different to what they're putting out publicly. So they're making a certain set of demands. The Saudis have backed off, I think, right now from establishing this trade relationship with Israel because they understand it would be very unpopular uh, in the Arab world, because there are those who support the Palestinians in their quest for what they call, you know, their own state. And so it's a very delicate issue with, you know, major powers, Arab powers like Saudi Arabia and Egypt in particular. Yeah. So you know how the this, this story goes every time Israel gets attacked, and this one, of course, has been the October 7th was the worst single day attack on the Jewish yeah. people since the Holocaust. Uh, so you yeah. get various countries in the West, you're mentioning some of the Arab world condemned Hamas's actions, but if they really were people of goodwill, they would go in there, they would surround them, they would say, give up the bad guys and, yeah. and enact justice. Instead, like every other time, Israel, with some help from the West, you know, the US and some other countries, um, Israel's the one that has to stand there and, and deal with it, and then they end up like every time they're quickly made out to be the bad guys because there's yeah. more Palestinian deaths than, than yeah. is Israeli deaths. And Hamas knows how to play that game. Absolutely. Israel has to play the game because they don't have a choice because it's an yes. existential threat. But then you know, if, if the people that decry the, the so-called innocence or so-called innocence, um, dying in, in 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 gaza why don't they get their act together give an ultimatum to 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 gaza to hamas and do something about it but they don't no they don't the fact of the matter is what's happened one of the things we knew would happen when israel went into gaza besides the air raids but they were planning a ground assault we knew very very well what what would happen we knew that the collateral damage would be high because the Israelis said, look, we gave them warning. Anybody who remains in the north, from our point of view, we, we regard them as we would regard enemy combatants. If they die, they die. Well, there's been this outcry in the nations. Oh, my God. And the issue of humanitarian aid. When we cut off fuel to the land and so on, fuel, power, water, and so on. Imagine this. Here we are supplying these people with electricity, supplying them with water, supplying them with fuel. What? So they can kill us all. Golda Meir said, you can't speak peace with people who want to kill you. And so when we say, oh, we're going to cut off the water. Oh, we're going to cut off the electricity. Oh, we're going to cut off the fuel. 
Everybody says, you can't do that. Oh, think of what they don't realize is more than 50% of the people in Gaza fully support Hamas. That's the problem. They're not innocent. They're not poor. You know, they're not poor people who, oh my God, look at us. We're victims. We're so intimidated. No, they put them in power and they kept them in power. You know, I don't care so if they're carrying guns. It's, it's inconceivable. So you, in, in, I'm sorry. In go essence, ahead. Keep going. Yeah. In essence, they're in collusion with these people. They're not innocent victims, most of them. Some are. But humanitarian corridors and everything that the West is insisting on, and then they began to tell us, well, you know what, we, you have these jets, these F-35s, and somehow they're controlled from the states, even though they're in Israel, and we can cut off your air force to some extent, and all kinds of crazy things are going on, so the nations can do what they think is right. The Israelis know that they've got to, <laughs> they've got to get rid of Hamas. And whatever it takes to do it, they're committed to do. But the nations are putting pressure on us. Now, yes, there are humanitarian needs. And yes, they have to be managed in some way. But the reality is we're looking at a situation where our enemy is using these things to manipulate us into not doing what we should be doing as they cry out to sy for sympathy to the nations. Al Jazeera is like, has become this Hamas rag. It's unbelievable. I don't even look at it. I get this Google News on my phone because I have a Google whatever. Al Jazeera is the one that's quoted the most. I look at it. I turn it off immediately. It's a Hamas rag. We see these demonstrations. We have seen what the, uh, the politica, politicization of people over something they don't even understand. They don't understand it at all. They have no biblical perspective to begin with. And secondly, they do not understand the situation on the ground, nor do they understand Hamas, that they're cheering when they kill and maim and, and, and brutalize Israelis. They don't get it. They're totally out to lunch. And so we're watching this thing happen. It's going down. And we know what we have to do is we have to clean out the rat's nest. We have to clean out the rat's nest. But it's going to be quite the job, Alan. It's going to be quite the job because, one, it's going to take months. Two is we have the northern front to worry about, where I live, up in the north. Three, the issue of the tunnels. Tunnel warfare is a... It's not like land warfare. We virtually have to turn, turn Hamas into a crater if we want to obliterate the tunnels or else flood the tunnels like the Egyptians did and seal them, and they'll be trapped in there. But... It's a, it's a really, really, really difficult, difficult task. So I don't even know what Israel would, would really accomplish with a ground invasion. They would be, we would be in there for months and months and months before we could actually do what needs to be done. And what I see coming down the, down the line is just another version of what we've seen for years. The nations intervene, they do this, they do that. And peace comes and, you know, we're all happy. And I go back to Aroma and whatever. There's another cafe I love in Naharia called Porto. They, they have these fantastic croissants with almonds. They're just ex excellent, right? And I'm sitting there drinking my coffee and, you know, everything is fine, right? And I can walk on the beach at night if I want, but I yeah, can't I just wanna, see. Bef yeah, before before we enjoy your croissant, um, uh, I was talking to Avner about uh, somehow Al Jazeera came up and, and he was very, he explained clearly it's, it's funded by Qatar yeah, and there are spokes, they, they actually speaking on behalf of Hamas. He said the English version is more moderate, but he yeah. said the, the Arab version is, is regularly death to Israel. And I yeah. think I, I really wanted people to park on this thing that I said earlier and that was and not because I said it, but the way Israel is is demonized in all this, if the world actually cared, not just about Israel, but about human beings, they would get their act together and they would put yeah. an end to this thing rather than right. letting Israel continue having to, having to fight the war on behalf of everybody else, yeah. um, which is where God has put our, our, our people. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's also that the whole in, the, the insidiousness of of what's going on, and I don't know how to ascribe motive. I I, I caution myself from doing that. But like what, what happened with the the blast 
by the hospital uh, the other day were immediately yeah. The, the world was saying Israel bombed, purposely bombed this hospital um, yeah. and the den and the PR damage was done immediately. It took, I, what, what day did the thing happen? Was it Thursday? It was something like that. It took until Saturday night before our minister of defense at 9.30 PM here in Canada yeah. finally said, well, it looks like according to the videos that it was an errant rocket from, uh, Islamic Jihad, but who's who, who heard that? The Prime Minister who posts about all sorts of things to his gabillion followers uh, is the one who should have come out and said something and, and he did it. Absolutely. I agree with you. So, you know, we're demonized in the process, but let me tell you something. Well, do, you know, do you want to talk? Well, do you know why? Why, well, tell me, why is it like this? Why is it like this? Because obviously, his posturing only goes so far. Do you understand? His Who's posturing? posturing? Oh, the um, prime minister. Oh, yeah. Oh, His I'm talking posturing. the Western, the Western world. Like, why? Um, so I was listening to a, 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 a helpful journalist the other day, and uh, they were saying how when the B the BBC made it breaking news about the Israel hits this hospital, why did they not do the proper journalism and check out what really happened before they demonized Israel yet again? Well, I think it has to do with the, you know, the character of the journalists themselves and where their sympathies lie. We've been so long characterized. You know, it's interesting. In one of Avner's letters, uh, he, uh, he quotes Bob Dylan and his song about the neighborhood bully. I don't know if you read it or not, but, you know, we've been, we've been characterized for so long as the neighborhood bully and these liberal, you know, trained journalists automatically take the side of the oppressed and they've been sold a bill of goods that we are oppressing the Palestinians and rather than them understanding that when you have a man for argument's sake like Mahmoud Abbas who has become uh, a billionaire and not given to his people and the same thing with the leaders from Hamas that they've exploited their people and not given them what was legitimately theirs and given from the nations to promote the welfare of those people, they do not understand the. They do not have a clue about the true nature of the Middle East and the true mentality of the Middle East. They don't understand it at all. We have this stupid idea that everybody thinks like us. We're good people. We stand up for the oppressed, and if we think they're oppressed, immediately when the neighborhood bully strikes one of these people that we think is oppressed. We jump to the defense of the oppressed people as we perceive it. And, the, and I have to say that, you know, uh, the Palestinians have done a wonderful job uh, persuading the world that they are an oppressed people. They should be pointing the finger at their leaders who've become billionaires in the process and espouse the brand of Islam that many people say is not Islam and allowed militants to take control. I mean, there's huge intimidation at work, whether it's on the, the Shamran side or whether it's on the Gaza side. These people have the guns, they have the weapons. If you don't line up, you know, with them, you're dead. You're dead. You're gone. They don't stop at that. So what I'm saying is they don't understand the nature of the Middle East. They don't understand the nature of Middle Eastern leadership, which is basically uh, fascist and dictator, dictatorship. And because they don't get it, because they think as liberals that all sane people think like they do, they jump to the side automatically of the one whom they believe is oppressed. And they've helped to characterize, they, they've helped to create that illusion, Alan. They have helped to create. In fact, they've created that illusion. Yeah, I want to, I'd like to jump in there because uh, it, it hit me just this morning, the yeah. way uh, Hamas has uh could I say brilliantly played the victim card yeah. because yeah. Muslim, Muslim, like our people are historically, if we're going to talk about the oppressed and the victim, not always for the whole history, but for a lot of our history, we've been ruled by foreigners. We've, uh, we've lived in a diaspora dispersion. Uh, anti-Semitism is the highest form of hate crime in a place like pl nice, polite Canada. Um, 
and what, and when, then we get resented when we succeed. But let's not go down that trail. On the other hand, uh, Islam as an yeah. ideology is an ideology of conquest, world Absolutely. conquest. That's yes. not to say every Muslim dreams about taking over the world, but as an ideology, it's it's very fueled with conquering and uh, subjugating other people and subjugating the under Islam and all the rest. And so they have that philosophy and yet understanding the cultural moment we're in and how the the greater the victim you could be perceived as, That's the right. more exactly. sympathy you get and their Absolutely. ability yeah. to do what they did on October the 7th, raping yeah. women, capturing grandmas, uh, beheading babies, and yet, just like that, they're the victim. Woe is me, we're being, help, help, we're being attacked by bad, big bad Israel. When they didn't just poke the eye of the bear, they went in and they slaughtered the bear's babies. That's exactly what they did. And they're getting their just desserts, for sure. They're getting their just desserts. And we're denied, you know, in the world's view, uh, you know, in the view of liberal, you know, liberal media and liberal politicians, we're denied the reality of saying there's just cause here and we have to do what we have to do. Let me read well, folks, I want to say it again. Why don't we have protests calling countries like Qatar and Saudi Arabia and Jordan and Lebanon to stand for what is right and put Hamas down? Amen, brother. Now, I want to read you something. I'm going to take it. This is biblically speaking, and I want to just put this in here. And it's from Psalm 33, verses 16 and 17, because this is what I've been praying, because I knew the pressure from the nations was going to come on us. I knew that we were going to be characterized in this fashion simply because it's just a continuation of what's been happening. But this is what I want to say, because I, I had prayed it. It says, no king is saved by the multitude of an army. A mighty man is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a vain hope for safety. Neither shall it deliver by any its great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield for our heart shall rejoice in him because we've trusted in his holy name. Now, a few, the last week sometime, the Lord gave me Psalm 24. I shared it with Giulio Gabelli because I couldn't be on the prayer call. And the idea is that um, if the Lord goes before us in this and we're resolute in what our objectives are, they're clear and we're resolute in it, then the world be damned. That's all I'm going to say. The world be damned. Because frankly, they're acting like a pack of damned people and giving us advice, giving us counsel that frankly will only lead us to the same conclusion that it's led us in the past. We may have mowed the lawn a little more, a little more closely than we, di we did in the past, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to yield the same results because these men are holed up in their, temp in their tunnels with their weapons and they'll rebuild and they'll come out. And they're going to do the same thing over again because they are implacable. You cannot make peace with people that want to kill you. And we need, with the Lord's help, to go in there and take care of what's there so that it doesn't rise again. And so far as in engaging the nations, I have to tell you, my friend, I am not hopeful at all. I believe we're in this thing alone, pretty much, with some support from the states, which is conditional on all kinds of things that would hinder us. Why do you think we're sitting out there for 16, 17 days already, our army's out there training, 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 when we probably should have gone in a while ago? Now we're being told by some American Marine general, oh, you know, you, you, you're, you guys aren't ready. This is ridiculous. We're ready. We want the Lord to take us forward. That's what I'm praying for. Lord, take our boys forward. I want to tell you a story, Alan. We have some friends, and I think you know them. Uh, the, the name is Moon, Michael and Zipporah Moon. You may recognize the name. Their son, their son Moses, I love that, Mo, Moses Moon, M.M. <laughs> Moses uh, left Canada. He 
joined the army in Israel as a, you know, as a lone soldier volunteer. And um, I remember I was at something called Moses Tekis. The Tekis is an induction where they go through basic training. They have like a khaki colored beret. And when they actually uh, become part of the regiment, they're given the regimental beret, which is a certain color. It could be red. It could be blue. It could be green. It could be any one of a number of colors, but it identifies them. So we went to Moses Tekis and when he, he was inducted. And I'll never forget it as long as I live because I'm sitting there in this Tekis, this induction ceremony, very military, you know, with the, the sergeant, you know, snapping out orders and they put their rifles up, they put the rifles down, they march, they this, they that, you know, all the stuff they do. And I'm sitting there with Florin and we're feeling the presence of God. And I'm saying, I don't get this. The Lord is here. I don't get this. We left the place and I went to the Lord. I said, ah, this, is, this is my army. This is my army. They're not just any army. This is my army. And so when I say, God, go before them, if this is your army, you go before them. You give them the strategy. You give them the resolve to do whatever they have to do and not let themselves, you know, what I'll call worship the gods of man. There's that song that says, we will not bow down to the gods of man. They can't afford to bow to the gods of man, Alan, to the so-called good advice they're receiving. Because frankly, if they do, we're going to have another round in a few years when they've rebuilt. And that's what I feel. I feel that strategically we're making a big mistake not allowing our army to do what they have to do. We're trying to do it morally. We're trying to save civilian lives. And Hamas is telling, them, don't leave. We need you there as human shields. Don't leave. Yeah, so that that was your description there was very moving. Uh, how do we answer people that would react to, but the Israeli army, yeah, there's some religious ones. Most of them are secular. How can you say that God is involved in this you know, military group of this country and, and, and all the I'll rest. I will explain how. It's very, very simple. Number one, the land is his land. We see this in Deuteronomy 11. His, you know, his eyes are on it from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. Number two is we are a covenant people. We are the people of God. I think one of the biggest misunderstandings that I see amongst Christians is their misunderstanding of the fact that Israel are as much the people of God as they are. We may at this time, maybe only a small percentage of us are what you would call a saved people who know the Messiah, but the Lord has made some very, very clear promises to our people. Now, those clear promises have to do with our possession of the land and so on, promises to work with us and help us, to keep possession of the land. So what I'm saying is the Bible makes it abundantly clear that God has not forsaken our people. Has God cast away his people? God forbid. He has not cast us away. Yes, there's a blindness on us when it comes to knowing who the Messiah is, but we are still God's people. It speaks about the dough and the lump. It says if the, you know, if the lump is, if the dough, if that segment of dough we take out is holy, the dough is holy. The lump is holy. We are still set apart to the Lord and for his purposes. And for that reason alone, just for that reason alone, God will be with us. He will open our eyes. I'm hoping, like, for example, if you don't think, I'm, I was reading the scripture the other day. There's a Psalm 118. Unbelievable. It speaks about how the Lord chastens us. I am telling you that because of what has happened in the land since the last election, the division, the strife, everything else. From my point of view, it's like the days of the judges, okay? This is my, you know, if we're gonna talk biblically, I'm giving you my biblical perspective. This is like the days of the judges. We had to wake up. We had to realize that we are one people, you know? 
Am Yisrael Chai, the people of Israel live. We are one people with one destiny. There's a land that's been given to us by a covenant promise to our forefather, Avraham Avinu. We know this, and that's just the way it is. And God is, he used, unfortunately, the barbarism, not to get the support of the nations, but to wake us up, among other things. Yeah, Horrible. that's that's a that's a, a great a great point. I, one of the, my perception is for a lot of Bible believing Christians, the some of the difficulty they have with this kind of talks, they don't understand that there's a national covenant with the people of Israel. Absolutely, because we're very focused. Bible believers are are focused on the individual and the individual's that's faith true. and their relationship with God, and they think that when we're talking about God's covenant faithfulness to our people that automatically uh, means those, those, those individuals That's are right, right with God like Abraham and David and, and yeah. so on were. But there's actually two things going on. And by the way, there's a good place to, to mention that on November the 5th here in Ottawa in the evening, I'm going to be doing a special presentation on Israel that I'm calling Israel and the Faithfulness of God. I've been advised, I'm still looking into this, whether it's a good, um, advisable to uh, give you the location through, through no. this kind of medium. But no. if you're interested in that event, contact me at comments at thinkingbiblically.org. Now, speaking about the, 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 how the, the, if the peace is holy, the whole lump is holy. That's yeah. from Romans 11. I, I like right. to talk about one of those holy pieces and I want to get your response to my son's blog post. I think your son's blog post is an excellent blog post, but I think it's more relevant. And I think I said this at the outset. I saw it as being very relevant to our situation here in the here in North America. Here, well, not only North America, but it can be in Great Britain. It can be in France and other oh, outside places. of Israel. Outside of Israel, yeah. I think that the, even though the threats are immediate in their own way in many of these places now, and I see the possibility of that, that threat heightening because they're putting extra security at the synagogues now in North America and elsewhere. Um, nevertheless, specifically, I think what your son has presented is very true, but it has more relevance in the diaspora than it does to, you know, the Jewish state, which currently is surrounded by enemies who have no regard whatsoever for us and see it as their, how shall I say, their sacred duty to annihilate us. So yeah. that's, uh, that's the difference for me. Yeah. So, so, uh, for people who don't know, uh, my son Josh wrote a blog post that he actually did just to get his thoughts out there. He didn't think it was going to go viral. Um, and it's addressing how some of our people, how Jewish people might be responding to non-Jewish silence with regard to the things that happen. And he talks about how we fundamentally don't feel safe in the non-Jewish world. That's right. Um, and uh, he immediately started getting uh, positive responses from Christian friends, but we didn't know it was going to strike a chord in the Jewish world and get picked up. In fact, it ended up being reposted on a news site in Israel, and then a, um, a political journalist with the Toronto Sun here in Canada was so moved by the article, not Jewish himself, as far as I know, yeah. um, that he did an article on Josh and his blog post that appeared this yeah. past weekend. Yeah. And um, I'm, I'm very proud of my son. He really did not think it was going to, that was going to happen. And so um, there probably still are um, some of our non-Jewish acquaintances and friends who haven't said anything. What would you say to them, Michael, at this point? <laughs> what I would say to them is this. We are, we Jews in the diaspora in particular are an endangered species. Notice okay? he's chuckling again, folks. I'm chuckling because this comes from an experience I had many years ago. I was in Hong Kong uh, doing a watchman meeting with, uh, you know, with the watchman group. So this would go back maybe to about 2008 or 2010. And as I was there, I reflected on the fact that Chinese civilization and uh, Jewish civilization are both about the same age, 4,000 years old, approximately, give or take. 
And then I ran the numbers. There were one and a half, you know, there were well over a billion in China and probably another half, uh, another half billion in the, in the Chinese diaspora. And there were only maybe 14 and a half million of us worldwide after 4,000 years. So if you think that we're not an endangered people, if you don't understand that Satan has a vested interest in destroying us, then, you know, you live on another planet. We're Bible-believing people. There is a devil. And the devil is doing whatever he can to hinder the plan of God in regard to the kingdom coming to earth and the reign of the Messiah being established on earth. That's just the end of the story. But we may be few in number regarding other civilizations, but we will prevail. Because if we don't prevail, then our God is a liar, and he's not a liar. What he says is what he does. He's with us. So we're survivors. We are going to survive. We've watched empires come and go, but we are going to survive. Because even though our Christian friends may not understand much beyond individual salvation, we are a people of God as you are a people of God. God is with us. And because his word is true, he has a vested interest in seeing that every single word of his, of all of it, not one of them will fall to the ground. And this is what I have to say to your listeners today, both those who believe and those who don't believe. There is a God. And this God is the God of Israel. He loves our people as much as he loves those who've given their lives to the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. He loves us every bit as much. And his words will not fall to the ground or fail. Period. That's where I stand. So at the end, we win. Period. At the end, we win. And those who opposed us will stand before him one day at the judgment and give an account if they are not giving an account already, the ones that have fallen. And that's where I am. Yeah. Well, well said. So uh, Robin and I attended the Ottawa Israel Solidarity meeting at the Jewish Community Center yeah. um, a week ago Sunday. Uh, no, yeah. a week ago Monday it was uh, Canadian Thanksgiving evening. And yeah. we were, well, we were thrilled to see the turnout of maybe there was a couple thousand people there with the prime minister and other other dignitaries were there and it was it was astounding so i've i've grown up singing and you referred to it earlier am yisrael hi the people of israel yeah. live and i've i'm going to choke up now i've never sung it like that in the face of of what just happened two days prior yeah. this crowd of mainly jewish people and other guests singing Am Yisrael Chai. And then there's the second line, Od Davinu Chai, our father yet lives. That's right. And uh, I actually looked it up on Wikipedia because that's uh, besides the Bible. Next, there's where you find out everything. <laughs> and, the, and it's a Shlomo Karlebach song. And you can look it up when it became popular. And, and the words actually come from Joseph's um, question to his brothers, is my father still alive? But when referring to Jacob, when Karlobach wrote uh, this this one, which is it's fairly, I think it's from the 70s uh, or 60s, um, something like that. That's besides the point. He applied it to God. Yeah. As our, so as we were, most, most, you know, a lot of people don't understand. Most Jewish people are fairly agnostic about God. There's, yeah. there's very religious ones. There's semi-religious ones, smattering religious ones. And even among the religious ones, they may yeah. not be sure that there is a God. Yeah. We are a people first with a, with a strong religious thread in, in, in who we are. But we, we're a people. And here we are, most of those people in that crowd don't think about God that much. Some of them are upset at God because of the Holocaust and why he doesn't do more in a situation like this. And they're all singing. The people of Israel lives, our father in heaven yet lives, not knowing the truth that they're speaking, that you were just emphasizing, Michael, that because of God's covenant with our forefathers, he will come through uh, Absolutely. Uh, uh, for us. Does, and if it's despite us, it'll be despite us, but he's still going to come through for us. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, uh, I want to read another passage of scripture 
because God came before the Jewish people came. God came first. God came first. Yes. <laughs> and he came to our he came to our forefather Abraham. I want to read this. It says about Jacob, it says here, uh, it says, For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the place of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land, a howling wilderness. He encircled him, he instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye. As an eagle stirs up its nest, hovers over its young, spreading out its wings, taking them up, carrying it on its wings, so the Lord alone led them, and there was no foreign God with them. And I could go on. But that's just the reality. God came first, and he found the people. It's not, you know, we look at ourselves as the descendants of this man, but the reality is, God came first. He chose us. Maybe some of us said, why doesn't he choose somebody else? And I understand in the light of our history, our chosenness has cost us a lot. But nevertheless, God came first, his choosing came, and then we came because he watched over us. And if he's watched over us this long, even though we've taken, on, taken the blows, He'll watch over us to the end. So I look at this altercation with Hamas and all the others. I'm not, I'm not worried about it because I know that in the end, it will all end well. Between now and the end, not so good. <laughs> but, but in the end, it will all end, end well because God, number one, exists. Od Avinu Chai. That should be first. Od Avinu Chai. Am Yisrael Chai. I would turn it around, you see. God came first, and that's what I see. If God yeah. can fail, then as a people, we'll disappear. Yeah. So I um, don't normally do this, but, uh, well, what I might do is ask somebody like yourself, how sh shall people pray about what's going on? This is the part that I haven't yet done on my podcast, but I'd like to ask you, um, I did ask you beforehand, um, why don't we close with, can you, would you pray for the situation? I will do that. Avinu Malkeno, our Father and our King, we come to you now in the name of your Son, Yeshua. And we bring the current situation before you. Lord, you've directed me on more than one occasion simply to pray that you would be the one who directs the course of events and not the nations. You are the God of Israel. You showed me years ago at, at Moses Moon's Tekas that these are your, this is your army. Others may disagree. I don't care whether they disagree or not. But I pray above all that you would guide the leaders of the nation to give them wisdom as they give direction in this situation to the nation and give wisdom, I pray, to those who command the army. And not only give wisdom to them, Lord, but also to move them to do by your spirit the things that they must be doing at this time to give the orders they must give to strengthen the combatants who will go into Gaza to do what they must do and persevere in that which you've mandated them to do until it is done and a result is achieved that brings not only glory to you but will certainly set back this threat that we've been this cloud of threat that we've been living under for so many years that blew over that fence and committed an atrocity that we haven't seen since the days of the Holocaust. Lord, we're asking for your direction. We're asking for your help at this time that what you say should be accomplished will be accomplished. And we ask it in Yeshua's name. You said, Father, whatever we asked in the name of Yeshua, you would do so the Father might be glorified in the Son. We know that the day will come. We know he appeared once as the commander of the armies of the Lord of hosts. I pray that the battle strategies that are required will be downloaded to those 
who give direction and followed by those who must implement it. We ask it in Yeshua's name. Amen. 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 Wow, that was great, Michael. Thank you so much for uh, for doing that with me and looking forward to seeing you soon in person, yeah. hopefully. Yeah, well, yes. Yes, okay. we will. Yeah. We will see each other. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. I know I've been very forthright in a lot of things I said, but well, you asked me to go come on this program. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, we know God is the one who's altogether right. And I, I, my, my prayer is those who, the people who know about the Bereans in the New Testament, that they'll be like Bereans and that they yep. will search this word um, to see if these things that you're saying are so. Amen. So Very again, good. thank you so much. And as they say in Hebrew, lehitroot. Lehitroot. Yeah, until we see each other again. Well, that's two podcasts in a row where my guest took me by surprise. So again, if you haven't checked out uh, my podcast with Avner, please do so. And you need to watch, not just listen to it, as you see my reactions to some of the things that he said. And again, without going into all the details, I basically do agree with Avner. And then when Michael now talked about the current Israeli army as God's army, well, I haven't heard anybody put it just like that. It was a little bit alluded to by Avner. But this, this is, it's different for me. I'm sure it's different for a lot of you. But I, I called him up right after it was done, just a few minutes ago, and, uh, and said to him, the fact is, we people who, who claim to believe the Scriptures, and as a Messianic Jew, Old and New Testaments, the army of, the, of Israel in the Old Testament was not made of all these made up of these pious, God-loving people. Paul says it well in Romans, that there's always been a remnant of true believers among the people of Israel, and that has always been true to this day. The army of Israel in the Old Testament was, in the the Jewish Bible, uh, was an army assigned by God to do God's will. And then this becomes the question— and this is something that Michael believes that God himself showed him. You may or may not agree with him. But scripturally speaking, this has more to do with God's interests than the spirituality and the, the piety of the people themselves. So please, let me know what you think. You can write me at comments at thinkingbiblically.org. If you want to get in touch with Michael, you can let me know and I can pass your comments on to him. And also, don't forget, if you're in Ottawa, if you know anyone in Ottawa, on November the 5th in the evening, 6.30, I'm going to be doing a special event. I'm calling it I'm calling it Israel and the Faithfulness of God, as we're going to do, God willing, an overview of what the Scripture has to say on God's relationship to the people of Israel. So please pray about that on, on our behalf, and if you can make it, that would be great. And... Uh, if you want more details, please write me at comments at thinkingbiblically.org. Until next, until next time, this is Alan Gilman with Thinking Biblically. Thinking Biblically.